All right. So, um, obviously today, as we fellowship together, um, we're going to enjoy a meal together. I'm looking forward to that. And this is just this week coming up, especially as a, a week, you know, that we set aside to just give thanks. And so it's good for us to think about those things we're thankful for. Um, you know, Paul says this, and, and obviously y'all know these verses, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. He says, in everything, give thanks. Paul says in uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1, he says um, that he exhorts, therefore, that giving of thanks be made for all men. Um, we should be thankful for each other. Um, and I want to tell you all this this morning. I am super duper thankful. That's like big time thankful, by the way. I am super duper thankful for Liberty Bible Church, but here's why. Because you guys are truly a biblical church. Now, here's the twist and here's the turn. When I say biblical, here's what I really mean. And you need to pay attention. Bill is laughing. <laughs> Bill, good to have you back, man. Look, you're front and center too, so you're getting all the comments and questions today. So you got to be on the ready, all right? Uh, but when I say I'm thankful that you guys are a biblical church, when I say biblical, what I mean by that is you guys are weird. <laughs> Caleb said, yes. Weird, okay? Um, you're weird. Um, and did you know this? Did you know that it is biblical to be weird? Gene, did you know that? You need to because you and I especially, we're weird naturally, but now we can justify it and say, no, we have to be. It's in the Bible, right? Happy to be weird. And y'all know, when I say weird, I really mean that in the way we typically think about the word weird as something sort of being out of the ordinary, maybe bizarre or strange and just overall different. Just as a side note, uh, Roblin, I talked to Crowder this morning because I, you know, I get up at four on Sunday mornings at like 4.30 I was texting Crowder and he's over in Spain, y'all. So it's like lunchtime over there, you know, so I'm texting him everything. And I got to thinking about Crowder. Crowder... He uh, it, it, at one point he sort of characterized our little church, and and he put it into words that I thought were so fitting. He said we are misfits, and that's what we are. We are weird misfits, and uh, but here's the thing: we have a biblical mandate to be weird. Look here in Ephesians chapter four, Gene. Ephesians chapter four, and look with me at verse seventeen. Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. We are to walk not as other Gentiles walk. We are to walk differently than other Gentiles walk. Okay? Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, people, people walk in a lot of different ways. And, and you can kind of tell by somebody's walk a lot about what's going on. So, for example, if I came in today and, and I came up here to teach and I was kind of like this. What's that walk telling you? A wore out. I mean, just slapped, tired. I mean, just done. Uh, what if I, y'all, what if I came in today and... It's time to preach, and y'all are all sitting down. You got your Bible out, and I kind of... i kind of hesitant to get up here. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's this. That's this, you know. <laughs> that's right. I'm watching you. You know, what that probably tell you is, that boy didn't study. He don't know what he's talking about today. Um... Uh, you know, um, here's another one. You can always tell. Uh, I get I get hung up in this sometimes, but I'm like, and, and you may say hey to me, and I just go on right on by. Or you ask me a question, I give a quick answer, and I keep on going. You know, you can tell a lot about people and how they walk. If they're hurried, if they've got something on their mind. You know, now the kids, there are times they may be across the room and they do something that I don't like and makes me mad. My mad walk is different than my happy walk. 
You know what I mean? Mad walk is like with purpose and with conviction and usually with gritted teeth. You know, I'm I like, it's, it's a different walk. But people walk in a lot of different ways. Hey, you know, I love watching sports because at the end of the game, you get two different walks. The winner, they're walking with a chest up high. They got a lot of swagger, you know. They're high-fiving everybody and all this stuff. And the loser's just ready to get out of there, you know. <laughs> and so our walk says a lot about us, right? And so walking has much to do with our manner of life, all right? And when Paul uses this word, uh, walk, not as other Gentiles walk, that's how he means it, to have a particular way of going about daily life. So when Paul says walk, not as other Gentiles walk, he's talking about our daily going about our business, okay? And so um, what's interesting is Paul uses this word walk 37 different times throughout his writings. And not one single time when Paul uses the word walk does he use it in a way where he's talking about put one foot in front of the other, then the next. He doesn't mean it in that literal way. He means it in this idea of our daily lives and how we go about it. Now, what Paul says here, he says that we are not supposed to go about daily life like everybody else. We need to be weird. You need to be weird. Y'all, I, I've told y'all this before, um, especially on Sunday mornings. I love to listen to other preachers. And, you know, be that as it may. But I was listening to a Church of Christ preacher this morning, and boy, he was laying it on heavy. And I, I turned the radio off. I, I was feeling guilty. And I was like, man, I am just not measuring up. But he said something that really kind of, I, I liked what he said. He was talking about being in the world, but not of the world. And he said, you know, you don't need to plunge yourself into the filth of the world just so you can have some impact. He said, just imagine there's a little boy. Y'all imagine Seth. And we put a, a brand new white pristine clean t-shirt on Seth. And we tell Seth, Seth, go out there in that backyard and, and in our backyard it's nothing but dirt. Now the scripture says we're supposed to stay unspotted from the world and this was his illustration. Now you imagine Seth going out in the backyard and you give him 30 minutes. What do y'all think that white t-shirt is going to look like when he comes back in? That shirt is going to look dirty, but imagine you go out there and look at that dirt. Do you think that dirt's going to look shirty? That's what he. That's pretty good. Be careful of that, right? <laughs> Claire's like Greg. That was too close, man. All right. But so we we need you know us believers. We're supposed to be different. We we're, we're gonna we're gonna be like people with three eyes. People are gonna look at us like we're crazy. You know why? Because you're crazy. Rita, have you thought about the things you say you believe in lately? You're crazy. Tenfold hat crazy. <laughs> and you're in good company, right? Because we're a bunch of crazies here. But we're supposed to be. And here's our biblical mandate. Paul says, walk not. Go about your daily life. Do not do it the way other Gentiles go about their daily life. Now, in context here, Paul is talking about um, that we're to be different than the lost world of Gentiles. Look at verse 18. Here's how I know he's talking about lost people when he's talking about the Gentiles, other Gentiles. He says they have the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God. So it kind of makes sense that you and I need, as believers, need to look and act and behave differently than lost people, right? Cotton, you speeding ain't different than the lost people. I'm stepping on your toes like, man, why are you coming at me? Gene, that temper of yours, now let me tell you. <laughs> it's because of cotton. <laughs> Blame it on God. I'm just, I'm just teasing. Y'all are just fun to tease with. But, hey, we, we kind of all get, hey, we're, you know, we know we're supposed to be different than lost people um, from those that are alienated from the life of God. But, y'all know, I'm, I'm also thankful that we're not like other believers as well. We are truly, and I mean we, Liberty Bible Church, we are weird Christians. You, you get all the Christians into one room 
and you plop Liberty Bible Church in the middle of that room, y'all, we're weird. We are weird. And y'all may not know this, this. We have been characterized in such a way. We've been called a cult. We have been put on a list at other churches to be avoided. And that is the literal truth. I'm not making that up. I love y'all's reaction. Because <laughs> we just kind of laugh and giggle at that. See, once you're a weirdo and you come to accept it, it just is what it is. You know, now you're free. I can just be a weirdo then. Right? And, uh, but, but we are weird Christians. The biggest difference that we have from other Christians is, is that our doctrine is weird. Y'all, I, I mean, even within ourselves, there are times, there are points where we teach things and we, we look at things in Scripture and, and we, we all kind of shrug at that or we, we draw back a little bit and go, oh, that's kind of weird, man. I don't know. I don't know. We've all had those moments, you know. I can tell you the first time Truman started saying anything to me, I thought, this guy's off his rocker. You know, I mean, he's old, he's senile, you know. I mean, he don't know what he's doing. He's, he's you know, got one foot in the grave, you know. Doggone if he wasn't right on some things. Y'all don't tell Truman he's right about everything because then he'll get the big head, you know. But well, our doctrine is weird. I'll grant you that. I'll grant you that. Um, but again, uh, these are distinctions that I think are important. Let me give you one example of the way our doctrine is weird. So y'all just read it here. You may not have even realized it. Verse 17, come back to it. Paul says, This I say, therefore. Now, that most people will read that phrase and just go right on by. Never even thinking that there is any particular importance about the fact that the Apostle Paul here, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, This I say. And they'll read on past that as if, well, okay, great, we know it's Paul. He's saying that he's just speaking in the first person, no big deal. Um, but not us weirdos, right? Us weirdos know enough now, and if y'all have been around the study of Ephesians long enough, you know there's a whole lot of stuff packed into every single word in this Bible, okay? And so there's some significance here. Now, when you and I read the Apostle Paul's writing, and he says, I say, is Paul saying something new? It's Paul saying something different that hasn't been said that you can't necessarily track out in the rest of Scripture. Because you and I understand the Apostle Paul was set apart in a different way, for a different purpose, with a different message. He himself says it over and over again. And how many times does Paul say, I certify you, I certify you? In other words, I guarantee you I'm different. I'm a weirdo. And so his message is weird. And so here when Paul says, I say, therefore, he's, he's given us something that's different. Let me give you another perfect example of this. For the longest time, this passage that we're about to read, it threw me for a loop. I couldn't quite... I couldn't quite understand what was going on. Y'all turn and look at it with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Hold your place in Ephesians 4. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This issue, when, when the Apostle Paul says, I say, uh, that's a big deal. We need to key in on those phrases. I did a search of this. I think there's 39 times that the Apostle Paul in one way or the other says, I say. Okay? Um, and it's pretty important when he says that, you need to tune in because you're getting some real unique information. Watch this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Come to verse 10. Now, in context, Paul's talking about different marriage, you know, concepts and principles and things like that. And look at verse 10. Paul says, And unto the married... I command, yet not I, but the Lord. In other words, the Lord gave him a command. Okay, so this is the Lord commanding. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but keep going. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Now watch verse 12. This is the one that used to throw me off. But to the rest, speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. I used to read that and I think, well, 
So does that kind of mean since Jesus didn't say it, it doesn't quite rise to the level of something so important, I need to obey it as a command that would necessarily come directly from the Lord? That's the way I kind of used to understand that. And I think it's kind of strange. So y'all know what I did? I just avoided it. <laughs> when you don't know, just go away from it. Don't, don't teach it. Because I didn't understand, I, I didn't yet have the understanding of what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Now here's what happens. When you rightly divide the word of truth, you understand that the Apostle Paul was given a unique and distinct revelation that was intended to fulfill or complete the Word of God. And in that, his revelation was new, particularly because he was saved and commissioned to be the Apostle to the Gentiles directly. That had never before happened. And so you go back and you look in the Old Testament, for example, all the laws and things that we get from the Mosaic Law, they were all intended for Israel. And it was all about Jewish relationships. And so when the Lord Jesus came along and, and during His earthly ministry, He's ministering to Jews only. Well, guess what? He's only going to talk about Jew to Jew marriage. He's not going to talk about mixed marriages. In fact, that was forbidden. Well, now all of a sudden you've got the Apostle Paul coming along and he's coming to all us people out there in the world who are all kinds of crazy, right? And now all of a sudden we're having to deal with mixed marriages. By mixed marriages, I mean those who are saved married to those who are lost. Well, what principles are there in the Scripture for those kinds of things? Well, to the Apostle Paul, guess what? You didn't have that. And so now by the authority of the Holy Spirit and because of the Lord's ministry through the Apostle Paul, Paul has the authority as an apostle to say this is how to handle this matter-of-factly and it is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Y'all with me? And so when Paul says, I say, that's significant. That's new. That's distinct. And it's very powerful information we get. Now come back to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says in verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. So when Paul says, I say, that means there's something new or different here that we're supposed to pick up on. And so what is the new or different information here in verse 17? What's unique about it? Well, the clue is actually there in the verse, and it's coupled with the fact that the Apostle Paul is the Apostle to the Gentiles. How many times does Paul say, especially back in Romans, he says, I magnify in mine office. In other words, he's making a big to-do about the fact that God called him to be an Apostle to the Gentiles. It's a whole new thing. And what's new here is the fact that Paul is writing now directly to Gentiles. Not Jews. He's writing directly to Gentiles to say, you Gentiles need to stop being so gentilic. Okay? I mean, that's a big deal. And so, because here's what happens. In times past, it was evident that Jews were to be different from the Gentiles, right? We can see that. It's very obvious when you go back and read the Scriptures. But now... We saved Gentiles, we believing Gentiles need to be different from lost Gentiles. We are to be ungentile Gentiles. That's the new thing. See, before, that was never said to us directly. There was not that ministry. And so Paul's writings, they, they bear this truth out about us being ungentile Gentiles. We are to be different. But there's a particular way in which we're to be different. Y'all look with me starting in verse 17 again. Paul says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Now, the lost Gentiles go about daily life 
in the vanity of their mind. And I love that little phrase because the word, the, the, the idea of vanity, the vanity of our mind is devoid of truth and appropriateness. Now that's a big deal. We need to spend a little time on this. So think about this. The world at large, the lost world at large, they are going about daily life completely devoid of the truth and devoid of an understanding of what is appropriate and what is not. Do y'all see any examples of that anywhere around? Yeah, exactly. They never think about God. They never think about what's appropriate around people who do think about God, right? I mean, there's just all kinds of craziness there. And so, but being without truth it leads to all sorts of outlandish behavior. And, and Paul alludes to that in verse 19. Look at verse 19. He says, these people in the vanity of their mind, they, they're being past feeling. In other words, that idea of being past feeling is their conscience anymore is so ignored and so betrayed that they no longer even have the, the hiccup to go, ah, oh, that may not be right. That may not be appropriate. And, and listen, by the way, all of us at some point in time, maybe we've all gotten there in some areas of life, and we have to recover that, okay? But you can, you can so ignore your conscience in any area of life to the point you don't even have the hiccup anymore. That's a bad place to be in. And it takes a divine work of God to bring you back to a place where you begin to perceive conviction again. But the lost world, they're just going about with zero, zero strength whatsoever. And he goes on, he says, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. That word lasciviousness is a tricky little word. But, but in essence, they really don't have any care for restraint. It, it, is, it is complete unrestraint and a complete disregard for any kind of order, any sort of dignity, any sort of... Um, Beauty even, um, it, it's just a complete disregard. And so what happens is, is at the point you get to where you're completely ignorant of truth or you've just, you, know, you just completely decided against it, eventually you just keep going your way till your conscience is dead and you end up doing all sorts of craziness because you have no regard for order or beauty or godliness or, or any sort of appropriateness. And that's what happens. And so... There's, there's that lack of it. And he says, uh, they've given themselves over in a lasciviousness, lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now that last part where it says they do it with greediness, in other words, it becomes a craving. Y'all know this, because of your nature, the nature that we are born with, the nature of Adam, the fallen nature, you all are addicts. Every one of you. You're an addict. And it is, it is purely inbred in our flesh to be greedy for what the flesh wants on all sorts of levels. Okay? It, money, um, material possessions, um, the list goes on. I mean, there's just a whole slew of things that the flesh... And remember what Paul tells us in Galatians. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would. I mean, there is a, there is a real war there. But the difference between the believer and the unbeliever is we now have the Holy Spirit to reawaken, to poke and to nudge us with conviction... When the thing we are looking to do is wrong, he can say, no, 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 no. And we can have some restraint and some perception about the thing being wrong. That's a big deal. The lost world has completely lost all that restraint. Um, Claire and I were actually talking about this the other day. Uh, <clears throat> every day Claire goes to the, to the school to pick up the kids. And the other day she said she was standing out there waiting to get Seth from, the, from, from school at the end of the day. And so there's just a group of parents standing out there talking, you know, and it kind of floored her. She said, you know, it just it threw her back. How many people are standing there at the elementary school in line waiting to pick up children and the foul language that's coming out of their mouth without any hesitation? Right there in front of mothers and other children who are waiting to get their siblings and just like it's, you know, it's just common language. 
That is a perfect picture of what it means these days to have lasciviousness. It, there's no restraint. There's, there's not even the thought that it's improper. I mean, I don't have to tell y'all if you, you know, go to any public place where there's a lot of teenagers hanging around anymore that there's a complete lack of restraint. I mean, look at the fashions of the day now. I mean, there's, there's, there's just no, no restraint anymore. It's just all been cast off. And, uh, and, and this is just the way the world works. Why do they do that? They want to. The flesh wants to, but look at this. Go back with me to Ephesians 2 real quick. Remember, you and I are not exempt from this. We have had, we've been there too. In fact, that's what Paul says. Ephesians 2, 2. 2, 2. Verse 2, chapter 2. Ephesians Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that spirit, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We can never forget the spiritual dimension of this. And, and, and that is what I think is the most unfortunate thing these days is that people, complete, even Christians, want to sort of ignore the fact that there is a real spiritual element here. Um... And so, that's what we see going on. Um, come back to Ephesians 4, though. Look what happens. Look at verse 18 again. <clears throat> the other Gentiles, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Now, look at this last part. Because of the blindness of their heart. I want you to notice that the kind of condition that the world has is a heart condition. It is a heart condition. It is not an education condition. It is not a lack of knowledge and information that is causing the world to suffer in complete lack of restraint and immorality and ungodliness. That is not the reason for it. The reason for it is a heart issue. And this is why I see this every time the political cycles roll around. You know, the world's answer to cure the ills of humanity is always education. No wonder we're in bad shape. I mean, if you're a teacher, no offense. Okay, but education. Listen, whether it's public, private, or otherwise... Education is not the answer. It's not. It will not solve the ills of the world because the ills of the world are, it's a heart issue. All right, Rita, you about to say something? Or are you just, are you just getting fired up? Okay. So, um, but it's, it's important for us to think that the more the, more the world you know, moves away from biblical truth and values, the more they'll, they'll look to education and other means to solve problems. But it's not going to happen. Um, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. At the end of the day, the gospel of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the key to solve the heart problem of the world. The gospel. Okay? It is the key. Look what uh, says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Come down to verse 12. He says, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ." But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon what? They can't see what really God was up to. <laughs> there is a blindness. Okay? Now look at verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, it being the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, here's the thing. You've been liberated by Christ. You've all been liberated by Christ. 
The lost world has not yet had the blinders removed because they haven't yet trusted the gospel. You and I, though, we have... Now come back to Ephesians 4. We have had the joy of trusting the gospel of Christ and then the, the beauty of having the Holy Spirit come in and do His work as a result of that and, and doing a whole, whole work of liberating us. And that's why Paul says in verse 20, he says, But ye have not so learned Christ. You, 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 haven't, um, you haven't been uh, saved so that you can just go and do whatever you want to. You've been saved and now the Holy Spirit has taken residence in your life so that now you can live in godliness. So that now you have that Spirit so you can walk in those good works which God has before ordained that you might walk in them. Okay? Um, you've learned Christ in such a way and so walk like it. Be weird. Gene, you have God's permission to be weird. Because you're weird. We're weird. <laughs> it just feels good to admit it, doesn't it? <laughs> My name is Gene and I'm weird. Well, you're in good company. Now, you've got to be careful here. When we talk about being weird, it's not just being weird for weird's sake. There's a particular kind of weird that we're to be, a, a kind of different. And, and keep reading here, starting in uh, uh, verse 21. If so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Notice you have a responsibility. Once you get saved... You have a responsibility, a daily and minute by minute thing you must do. And it is a work of making decisions to ignore the old man, to put on the new man, to live as Christ. Okay? That's a big deal. You're not going to be automatically perfect in your behavior as a Christian. That's the biggest lie of religion these days. It is not automatic. Okay? You have to do something to make that come about. And he says this, uh, verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, you know, anger is not a sin in and of itself. It's what you do with it. Okay? Neither give place to the devil... Let him that steal, steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. Hey folks, the world hasn't figured that out yet. You need to work. I thought I'd get an amen on that. <laughs> it don't come free. And so you got to get up and work. He says, you got to do the thing which is good. The reason why you need to do the thing which is good, because it's good for you. <laughs> you know, it does something. You know, as hard as it is to get up and go to work every day, it's good for you. There's a, there's a sense of accomplishment and achievement and even identity that comes with that. Good for us. Let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grace, not legalism, but grace. Um, you know, that one's going to step on everybody's toes here. Uh, we all have those days where we're frustrated, where we're tired, where we're angry, where, okay, I'm just going to confess, I can't stand, when I'm in the car, that's when I'm at my worst, y'all. Okay? I just, I am totally impatient when people don't do right on the road. You feeling me, Caleb? I know, see, Cotton, we're like a line of haters right here. Us three for sure. Trevor too? It must be some... Re, uh, Rita, Renee, are you that way too? No, you're good. I, I'm not bringing you into this then. It's just us boys right here. We need to talk. I'm just trying to find some good company so I don't feel so bad about myself. That's all, really all this comes down to. But y'all, listen, when I'm in the car, just get out of my way. Please, just leave the left lane open. It's really that simple. Know when you're supposed to yield. I don't even care if you put your blinker on. Just get out of my way. 
And so I got to admit, there are times this old stupid mouth of mine, it don't say godly things. And my kids, they love to keep me honest on that too, you know. So, you, But the Word tells us, and y'all, this is something we have to work at. We just have to work at it. And uh, we've got to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. That's, that's not easy to do. I guess when I'm passing people, when they finally get over, I'm supposed to say, grace to you, thank you, <laughs> finally for getting out of my way, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway, we've got to be gracious. He goes on, verse 30, this is sort of the catch-all. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Remember in your lost state, you had zero conviction. You had no conscience. Now all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes along, He indwells you, and He sort of wakes up your conviction and your conscience again. Well, don't... Don't deny that now, because once you've dulled him out of your life, once you sort of ignored him and so, you know, just become so callous, well, who's left and what's left to help you get back on the right track if you've now disregarded the Holy Spirit's effort in your life? you got problems, okay? So, believer, don't just sit there and just keep on sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and just think, well, I'm forgiven. Yes, that's true, you're forgiven, but you're hurting yourself. You're destroying yourself. What sense does that make? Right? And so this takes some continued work. He says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I love how Paul gives us just a, another quick reminder of the security that we have in Christ. That seal of the Holy Spirit cannot be broken. Okay? Praise the Lord. He goes on in verse 31, Let all bitterness when you're driving... And all wrath when you're driving. And anger when you're driving. See, it's just there. and you can't, you, can't, you can't get around it. Uh, and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Hey, listen, when it comes to forgiving others, especially when they've upset you, you will not find any reason in that person to forgive them. In fact, if you keep looking at that person and the way they hurt you, you're going to hate them more. Period. That's the truth. You will keep hating and that hate will build. The bitterness will grow till eventually that person moves on with their life and guess what's going to happen to you? You're the one stuck, bitter, rotten, and nobody wants to be around you. So instead of looking to some merit in that person as a reason to forgive them, no, look to the cross. Look to the Savior. And say, because I love Him, I'll forgive Him or her because I love Him. If you're looking for the reason in the person that hurt you as a reason to forgive them, you will never do it. You will only grow worse. Look to your Lord. Look to your Savior. That's the only way to do it. He says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God did it for Christ's sake, as He hath forgiven you. Um, a big deal there. And so, uh, as we close up today, that's what it means to be weird. The world does not operate in that way. The world tells you, I ain't ever forgiven, and I ain't ever forgetting. That's sort of the Amer American motto these days, by the way. And y'all, I'm proud to be an American. Love being American. At some point, we need to sort of forgive and forget and move on. You know what I mean? And so I, I think it's important for us as Christians to be sort of against the grain there and weird. Um, do everything weird. Be weird. Think about this list. Everything about it is weird, and it's just not how the world operates. So thank you. Liberty Bible Church and believers for being weird. You help me. I hope I can help you too. Let's help each other. I'm thankful for y'all. I really am. All right.